Good stuff. Well, we're going to talk today, as we talk about the theology of technology, we're going to talk about identity crisis. And let me start with just telling you who am I? Who am I? And uh, I am the patriarch of the Stump family, at least this branch of the Stump family here in the Indianapolis area. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about how my identity is shaped by those who went before me. Um, we've been doing research and we realized that Michael Stump Sr., spelled with a PF, uh, arrived in Philadelphia in 1743. And I have a, um, a picture here that while he was in, um, he moved from Philadelphia, he went down into Virginia, which is now West Virginia, and a surveyor, 16-year-old surveyor, by the name of George Washington, yes, that George Washington, actually wrote a journal of the surveying he was doing in the area. He surveyed Michael Stump's property and recorded that they camped on Michael Stump's property each night as they would go out and survey and come back to his property. And Michael Stump's name is right here on the screen in, uh, and it is in George Washington's actual handwriting. Can you see that? Right in the middle of the screen, I've highlighted a little bit with yellow. You don't have to see it clearly, but you can take my word. It's actually there and it can be seen when you uh, see it better. So that's the first stump in the United States. Michael Stump had a son named Michael Stump Jr. who had a, a stump, a, another son named Michael Stump II. And then there was George and Samuel and William and Harry, my grandfather. And then my dad was Richard Stump. Richard Paul Stump was his name. And here's a picture of my dad and my mom when they were newlywed. Actually, Audrey colorized this picture and it's so cool to see them when they were young like that. And so he's Richard Paul Stump. Then came Gary Stump, which I've never liked the name Gary Stump. I don't know how mom came up with that. She said I was named after Gary Cooper. And uh, Gary is such an awesome name, I guess. So anyway, we have that. And then you saw Richard Paul Stump, and then let, let me introduce you to my son, Richard Paul Stump II, right there with his family. And then let me introduce you to Richard Paul Stump III. Many of you know him. We call him Paul, and uh, this is him. And this is a copy of the front of his Bible. And Rick, that hit him the other day, and Rick sent me a text of, of uh, Paul's Bible, and it really struck Rick that there are generations of believers in our family. As far as I can tell, there are 11 generation of American stumps who have been followers of, of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, I'd like to talk to you more about that. So let me say it this way. When you ask, who am I? I am a blood-bought, born-again, spirit-indwelled, fully redeemed child of the living God. I've been delivered, sanctified, tested, reproved, called, and greatly loved by my Father in heaven. I'm the husband of my treasured wife, Kathy, for 31 years. I am the father of nine, four by marriage, and the grandfather of 18. I live in Indianapolis. I'm an Indianapolis native, a Hoosier, a proud American citizen. I'm a resident of Fishers, Indiana, where I serve as pastor of the greatest congregation in the world. I'm a 17-year-old volunteer chaplain, 17 year, not old, 17 year <laughs> volunteer chaplain of Fishers Police and Fire Departments. And I wanna tell you, I am greatly blessed. Let me ask you, who are you? How would you define your life and your identity? Aren't we all striving to know who we are? As it relates to technology, this is very significant, and I'm excited to be able to talk with you about this today. Do you know who you are, or are you creating your identity as you go with the tools of technology we have at our disposal? 
Are you living into the identity that has been given to you? Are you in the, or are you in the process of creating your own identity day by day? This is a dramatic question and brings to mind that a lot of people maybe are creating their identity a little like this that we get from the, from the cartoon Wally. Does this reflect you a little bit? Is that kind of how you're creating your identity with your face in a screen? On this Mother's Day, listen, moms, moms, leading your children to know their identity is one of the most important things you can possibly do for them. It is critically important that we begin to teach our children their identity instead of letting them figure it out as they go through life. Now, I understand what I just said. What I just said sounded probably like a screeching halt on your heart. You are not used to hearing that. We are told today that you have to go follow your heart and find your identity and figure out who you are. And um, there is a portion of that, but I believe that children need to be told their identity way more than we're doing in our culture today. And the problem is technology is getting in the way of our children and their identity, as well as it is our own identity. Notice that when I begin to talk about my identity, I'm talking about the past. This is a critical concept, a really important concept that we get, that we understand our identity is formed from the past. It is not something that you continue to form in the future. Now, it shapes, it morphs, no doubt about that. But to think that the, my identity is something that I have to create for myself as I move forward is a, is a mistake in our culture today. And technology is helping assist that. You understand that we've talked about that the original technologist, the creator, took already created materials and shaped them and formed them and built them into the greatest technology that has ever been on planet Earth, and that is human beings, man and woman. And no technology has ever exceeded the God's original technology of humans. And he created technology, the purpose of technology is to work, function, and to love, be in community. And so when I begin to talk about my identity, do you understand that I talked about what I do for work? And I talked about my family, my congregation, my city, and my ancestors who give me a heritage in my life. Who am I is the starting point for deep contemplation about God, self, and the world. The, Andrew Root wrote an article, he is a professor, at a, a seminary professor, and he wrote an article called Identity in the Digital Age. And uh, Matt forwarded this uh, article to me. It's brilliant what he's writing here. He writes this, not long ago, identity was understood to be established and retained more or less as it is throughout life. No longer, he says, the digital shrinking of time and space has made identity fluid. The healthy person was the person who could work and love. Adolescence was a time when you figured out what work you could do and whom you could love for the rest of your life. But as technology has sped up time and shortened space, at least in our minds it has, uh, the foundations of identity have melted, work and love have not held up well in the blur of time and space. And so technology shapes our identity today. Do you realize how bizarre that statement is? Technology should have nothing with, to do, listen, with shaping our technology, or our identity. It should have to do with maybe proclaiming it or representing it, 
but it definitely shouldn't shape our identity. And that's what's happening today. He said, we have embarked on the project of self. Let that sink in. He's talked about consumerism has replaced what we should be doing for work. Work has been transformed into consumption. What matters for my identity, um, Root says, is not what I do, but what I can buy. And what the things I buy say about who I am. Think about this. I am what I buy. What I wear communicates who I am. And I need the constant information of the internet, not only to inform me what to buy, but also tell me what the things I buy mean and allow and, and how others are perceiving them by commenting online. Think about that for a minute. Intimacy has replaced love. And we say, oh, intimacy is a great word. But in place of love is intimacy. We often hear someone will say something like this. I still love him. There just isn't anything there. Translation, there's no intimacy. We just want different things. In other words, he's not meeting my needs anymore. She's not meeting my needs anymore. And so I have decided to move on and find someone else to love with whom I can be intimate. Wow. Then we deal with on technology and on the platforms that are available to us through technology. We begin to create a body identity. For most people, often the most fundamental identity marker is their body. Whether they're fat, hot, ugly, by the way, Andrew Root wrote those words, tells me more than anything else about who I am. Really? Is that the way it should be? The internet is not a tool that disembodies me, but a tool that allows my body to be broadcast across time and space. The internet is the great genie that gives us ratings on our bodies and provides both things to buy, like Amazon for instance, and people to be intimate with, like through eHarmony or some other um, online site. So the question we want to deal with today, is identity something you build or discover for yourself or something you are told? And I understand in an American ear, I can hear that from an American ear. And I understand that when I suggest that your identity ought to be something that someone tells you, everyone resists. Our great American independent spirit says, no, it's about me. I need to develop my own thing and do my own thing. I understand that, but I want you to hear what, what God says about identity. What does God say about how we understand our identity? And I want you to hear this. God doesn't tell us to develop our identity. God tells us our identity. I want you to think about that for a minute. So let's talk about it. Identity is focused around your work, not just what you do for a living. That's not what I'm saying. But what you, what you provide to the society. A, a piece of technology has to function in order to be valuable. And remember Matt said, it has to benefit community. So how are you functioning in benefiting community. I want you to think about that. And that has to do much with how you see your identity. Tevya on uh, The Fiddler on the Roof talks about tradition. And actually when he says tradition and he sings that great song, Tradition, what he's really talking about is identity. And here's what he says about tradition. Because of our traditions, Every one of us knows who he is and what God expects him to do. Are you hearing that? In the traditions that Tevya is singing about on Fiddler on the Roof, he's saying it is the traditions that give us our identity. It gives us our function and it gives us our community. And those two together provide us with identity. 
Here is the premise of what I want us to hear today as we start this. Listen. The created, you and I, will only ever be able to find true identity in our Creator. The created can only find true identity in his or her Creator. You getting that? So, so listen to me. When Steve Jobs was part of the team and led the team that, that developed the iPhone, he didn't just put out a piece of product out there and say, you discover whether or not it works and how it works. He developed it with a purpose in mind. Do you understand? That's what God did. Us as his create, created uh, are, he has given us an identity that we are to live into. It started right the moment he created us. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and read just a portion of this. It says this, Then God say, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us, in our image and in our likeness. We call that, theologians call that imago Dei. In other words, the image of God. And in the image of God, we were created. And verse 27 says, male and female, he created them. And he made us in his image and after his likeness. And of course, the first thing we say, well then, do we physically look like God? Now listen, God the Father, Jesus said, no one has seen God at any time. But the only begotten Son, who is in the image of the Father, he has manifested him, declared him, made him known. So if you ask, do we look physically like God, we could say, well, we look physically like Jesus, who is God's son. So in one way, yes. But I don't believe that the physical attributes of human beings is what God intended when he said he was going to make us to be like him. And he gave us dominion. As God has dominion, God gave us delegated, limited dominion. Then God gave us a will, a will of our own. He gave us intellect, the ability to reason and consider and think and come up with profoundly brilliant ideas, which by the way, the most brilliant idea a human has ever had, the Apostle Paul says, is foolishness with God. So, so pick the most brilliant person you've ever known or the world has ever known, and God says what they're talking about is child's play compared to my brain and my mind. But as God has intellect, humans have intellect. And then we have emotion. So at least those characteristics are we are created in the image of God. Now that, that means, by the way, listen, listen. We are created. We are born with an image already, an identity already. We are created. We are born as God image bearers. Do you get that? We already have an identity. When we come screaming out of the womb, we have already been given an identity. This is a profound thought that we're getting lost in this day when we create and develop and morph and show and proclaim our identity through technology and the many ways that we do that. I'm created in God's image. I have an identity because I am an image bearer of God. By the way, if you stopped right there with your identity, you would be absolutely well along the way in understanding how to function and how to have community. Think about that. Oh man, that'll preach. Hey Matt, this is good stuff. Let's go on. Um, so God created us. So then we say, what is my identity? Psalm 139, 14 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now I want to do something and we go along here and I can't hear you do this, so you have to do it in your own. First of all, I want you to say, everybody in your family, everybody who's listening right now, say together, I am created in God's image. Say that. Secondly, 
I want you to say, you can say it to each other, you can say it however you want. I want you to say out loud right now, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Kathy's not saying it. Jonathan's not saying it. So. I said it. Yeah, yeah, they're trying to be quiet. Yes, I know. That is great. All right, the next one, listen to this. So, I am created in God's image. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am chosen by God. Chosen by God. Listen to this. Ephesians 1, 4. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. What a profound thing. So I want you to say right now, I'm chosen by God. I'm chosen by God. Yeah. Imagine almost everyone somewhere along the way has been um, in a group that's being chosen for various teams, right? And they, you have two captains and they keep choosing. Have you ever felt like you're never, never going to be chosen? Like you're waiting and waiting and waiting? Before the world began, God already chose you. What a beautiful thought. Let's go on. John 1, 12. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I could spend two hours on this verse. I won't do it, but listen to this. I want you to say this out loud. I became a child of God when I believed and accepted Jesus. I became a child of God when I believed and accepted Jesus. It is an amazing thing. All right, let's go on. Ephesians 1, 5. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. He didn't choose you. He didn't adopt you under duress. He did it because it delighted him. It was his desire to have you adopted into his family. So I want you to say out loud, I am adopted into God's own family. I am adopted into God's own family. All right, let's look at 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. So I want you to say right now, God calls me his child. God calls me his child. Think about that. I want you to think about that. Boy, I, I claim all my kids. I claim all nine of them. They are my sons and my daughters, and I love them, and I'm glad to claim them for my own. And uh, that's what God is doing, and he calls me his kid. I love calling my boys. I'll, I'll text them, and I'll say, I love you, son. I'll text my daughters, and I'll say, I love you, daughters. And uh, how awesome that is, that that's the way God is. In other words, when I'm living into that identity, catch this, I am living into the identity God gave me when he chose me and adopted me and made me and calls me his son. How amazing is that? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So I want you to understand your identity. I am made new. The old is gone. I want you to say that right now. I am made new. The old is gone. I am made new. The old is gone. All right, this next one. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. You are a chosen people. All right, we already saw that. Now it's talking about not just, listen, listen, your individual identity, but your identity in the family of God. You understand that each of my kids have an identity that's individual, but they are also identified, their identity includes their family as well. And that's exactly what God is doing here. And he says uh, in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people. Listen, you are royal priests. Royal priests, that's an incredible term. A holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. 
And when God adopted you into his family, when you had accepted and believed in his son, Jesus, and bringing you then to become a child of God, calling you his child, he did that in a group of others so that we together are the children, the family of God, and that our job is to function and to create community by showing others, listen, the goodness of God. Is that what you're doing with your individual identity? Is that what you're doing with your family identity? Is that what you're doing functioning in your church community? Think about it. John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide uh, in, in his slaves. You are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. Yes, I am a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ who is my brother as well. By the way, it's really, really good for your brother to also be your friend. You with me? Your sister to be your friend. Matter of fact, my daughters, each of them, their best friend on this earth is each other. Pretty cool thought. So, I am a friend of Jesus. Everybody say that. I am a friend of Jesus. Uh, in fact, listen to this. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You're not only a child of God, adopted, a friend, a brother, you are a co-heir with Jesus Christ. So say that right now. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. All right, so that's, that is who you are to love. Does that make sense? Because of that identity, it informs us who we are to love. Who we are to love is God first, our Lord Jesus Christ, other brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of the family of God. You getting this? And then God begins to talk to us about how we are to work, how we are to function in as technology, as his technology. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Yes, God has work for you and I to do. And that's what we should be busy doing, functioning properly as a piece, the most valued piece of God's technology, and that we are to function, we are to work, to do the work that he planned for us long ago. So say, I am God's masterpiece to do the work he planned for me. I am God's masterpiece to do the work he planned for me. Then God has meaningful, eternal work for you to do. I want you to think about this. Wouldn't it be sad if whatever you do to earn a living is the only work you actually did? So what? How sad would that be that that was all the work you did? In other words, you got up, you did your job exceptionally well, you got paid well, you paid your bills, you paid your mortgage, you provided for your family, and then you died and left it all behind. God says, no, I've got eternal work for you to do. And your work that you do for a living, that's just part of the work that's kind of undercover for the real work I have for you to do, and that is to produce eternal fruit. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting, eternal fruit. In other words, your life should have meaning and purpose, and it should accomplish, listen, eternal things. How are you doing on that? How tuned in are you to what God has for you to do for an eternal perspective? So I want you to say, God has meaningful, eternal work for me to do. 
God has meaningful, eternal work for me to do. All right, then, by the way, we think it's a pretty big deal, right? 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, We are therefore ambassadors for Messiah. Think about that, ambassadors for him. I am an ambassador for Messiah. Say that. I am an ambassador for Messiah. That's really awkward saying all this stuff. And by the way, here's I know what's going on right now. I get it. Many of you are saying that just because I told you to. You're not believing it. You're not internalizing it. You're just saying it because that's what the pastor asked me to do. It's getting old. He's done a bunch. Now, I get it. I get it. I understand it. But here's what I'm saying. You need to buy this stuff. You need to believe this stuff because what I'm giving you is not some philosophical mumbo jumbo that I created out of my own head. I am giving you the actual word of God, what God says about your function and about how you are to produce and have community. In other words, I'm giving you what God has said is your identity. Then 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So I want you to say, I have been given power, love, and self-discipline. I have been given power, love, and self-discipline. So here's the cool part. God, listen, listen, not only gave you the work, but gave you the software in your technology of your body in order to accomplish what God wants you to do, what he's called you to do, to be an ambassador, to work for behalf of him. It's incredible thought. And then Romans 8.37 says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. How often do you feel like a conqueror? How often do you feel like you're a defeated one when God says you are more than a conqueror through Christ? So I want you to say right now, I am a conqueror through my God who loves me. I am a conqueror through my God who loves me. And then finally, 2 Peter 1.3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. By the way, living a godly life according to your and my created identity is the, the absolute purpose for what God created us to be as image bearers. Go right back to the beginning. And so I want you to say, I have everything I need to be successful in my work. I have everything I need to be successful in my work. All right, now listen to this. What you just thought when you said the word work is you thought your job. And if you did think that right then, then you aren't listening to what I've been saying. The, to work and function as God intends us to function has to do with how we perceive and understand our identity. And we get way, way less concerned with what other people are telling us is our identity. And we begin to live fully into the function, the work, and the love, the community that God has created us to experience. The purpose for which he made us is to be his image bearers. We function and we have community as we worship God, giving him worth. That's a concept I want us to get. So what? You ask, so what? The cool part is you don't have to try to form or discover your identity. You just have to accept or believe or live out the one God has given you. You will never be more fulfilled than when you are living out the identity God already gave you. Listen to that. Let it sink in. So the real question is, what will I do with the thoughts contrary to what God has said about me? The more you spend on social media, the more you'll be torn down. You'll be told that what you're saying doesn't make sense, that you don't look good, that you have this flaw, that flaw. Let us tell you who you are. Matter of fact, you can begin to morph your your 
identity based upon how many likes you get on a particular page for something you've said or something you've posted or something you've done, some picture you've given. And uh, the more you do that, you'll get more and more and more. If you let people set your identity, you will get more and more and more away from the identity God created you to live out. And so we have to resist that. We have to resist letting others establish our identity by likes and dislikes, especially, by the way, people who don't know you fully. That, that, if we stop and say it that way, it goes, oh, that's silly. But we do that, don't we? So how do you do that? How do you accomplish that? And here's how you do it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful through God for the tearing down of strongholds. We are tearing down foul, false arguments and every high-minded thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah. I want you to catch this. This is brilliant what Paul is saying here. Every time you begin to go down the line of thinking, who I am is not enough. I can't make a difference. I do not belong. Those are the three great questions that get us off track. Again, wish I had an hour for that. Um, those three things, every time we go down that direction, we begin to get attacked by the enemy who says, you're not enough. You don't belong. You can't make a difference. Therefore, you have to change in order to be like people want you to be. And all we have to do is go right back to who God says we are. So let me say this to you. When you're feeling rejected, remind yourself that you are accepted. When you're feeling in bondage, remind yourself that you have been freed. If the Son will make you free, you will be free indeed because you have been redeemed. Like a slave who is in bondage and is redeemed in order to have their freedom. When you're feeling condemnation, remind yourself that you are holy and blameless in his sight. When you're feeling orphaned or alone, remember that you are adopted into God's family. When you're feeling ugly, you put the word in fat, however you want to say that, when you're feeling ugly, remind yourself that God says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. When you're feeling unloved, remember how greatly loved you are by the Father. And when you're feeling useless, remind yourself that you are chosen for a purpose. If we will walk through those ideas, and every time we're attacked, if we will capture that thought, put it in jail, and instead get our mind to believe what God has said, our identities are already formed in such a profoundly beautiful way that all we have to do is live into who God already said we were. You get that? Identity is not something you you shape for the future. Identity is something you live out that has been given to you by God. How amazing that is. Now here's the issue. On means of technology, especially social media platforms, all of those, they are trying to tell you who you are. Or you can believe who God says you are and just be that. What do you say? Don't you think that's a better way of doing things? Listen, moms and dads, let's make this choice to live fully into our identity. 
as we see what Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15. I can't think of a better way of doing that this week. By the way, moms, as mothers, your job is to constantly, continually affirm the identity of your children. Listen to me. Your child is probably not the most gifted athlete or musician or dancer who's ever lived. Quit telling them that. But let me tell you what. They are a uniquely chosen, adopted child of the living God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and provided with a purpose, a function, works that God planned for them before the foundation of the world. And if you will affirm and encourage and teach and remind your, your children of their identity, they will grow up into who God says they are. And they'll quit letting social media and technology dictate to them who they think they ought to be and they'll learn to be who God made them to be. What more beautiful thing could you do on this Mother's Day than that? So let's read this passage together. I want this to be the ultimate, the ultimate end of our identity and how we do life as individuals and as the family and as the family of God. Joshua 24, 15. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. And then Joshua gives some options because they're living in the land of Cana, Canaan right now. And there are all these other tribes living all around them. And he says, who will you serve? Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served back in Egypt, uh, back in the, before the Euphrates, before Abraham came? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? And then Joshua says this, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. You see, I am the patriarch of the Stump family. I say that with my tongue firmly stuck in my cheek, but also, listen to me, with a sense of awe and a sense of reverence to be who God called me to be and who we are as the family of God. We serve the Lord. 11 generations of faithful followers of Jesus Christ in the Stump family, the best I can do research on. They were all committed members of churches, evangelical churches, and members of the body of Christ. And so they're not just my ancestors, they're my ancestors in the Lord. And uh, I'm surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and we will serve the Lord. I'm making that choice for me. I'm making that choice for my family on this great Mother's Day. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us an identity. We don't have to figure it out. We don't have to work to find out what it is that you have given us an identity. May we learn what our identity is and be that, that which you've created us. May we quit looking for our identity from the created and look to you as the creator to give us our identity. And as we do that on this great Mother's Day, we pray, Father, that you will pour out your blessing on moms, that they will be able to teach and affirm and encourage and instruct their children to be who you created them to be Nothing will function or benefit community better than that. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, y'all.